Thank you very much. Hello, hello everybody. Uh, before we start, I just want to put it in context. I'm sure some of you don't even know where Cape Clear is. So it's off the uh, south west coast of Cork, about 50 minutes uh, boat trip from Baltimore or Skull. The normal way of going there is via Baltimore, uh, cross through the islands and eventually to the North Harbour in um, don't have a tower in it. The North Harbour is here, it's the Cape Clear. Fast that rock is just off the off the coast. Some of you might have read about the famous disaster, I think, back in 1979. So, um, the bay within which um, Cape Clear sits is called Rolling Water Bay, and the islands, so it's an SAC. So there's uh, literally, I don't know how many islands, but there's a hundred islands or something. Um, some of them quite large, as you can see from the map, and some of them very, very small, just simple rock outcrops. The existing harbour um, suffers, originally suffered from lack of shelter. It was very turbulent conditions during storms. Um, and the bull's nose, uh, which I'll show you shortly, is that protruding piece at the end. I hope you can all see it. That's known as the bull's nose because of its shape. And that, in effect, sheltered the outer harbour, which is this piece here. Uh, so the outer harbour, the outer basin, the inner basin, Duffy's Pier, outer breakwater pier, boom wall, and the far up one there, the bull's nose. So you can see the way that protects um, all of the area here from major storms coming from the sea. Or helps to protect at least. But despite that, there are still very turbulent conditions during storms. And the bull's nose is crucial for uh, some element of protection. Elsewhere in the harbour then there's a lack of depth and there's a lack of capacity. So all throughout here, there's shallow depths in here, it's quite shallow here, there's limited berthage along here, there's no depth here, there's a beach here. Capacity for boats then is obviously very poor. Um, road access. The road access is this road along here. Uh, roads on the island in general are very, very narrow. You literally couldn't pass, two cars couldn't pass. Not that there's many cars on the island, but there is a local island um, bus service which is subsidised. And there, and there are, you know, might be 10 or 15 miles, I suppose, of roads in total. Um, made them very, very steep and of very basic construction. Uh, the vulnerability of the existing structures is another um, factor on the existing harbour. Um, the existing uh, bull's nose was in very poor condition. Um, I hope to show you some cracks later on with very substantial vertical cracks on the pier. And it was close to collapse. Whether the collapse was going to happen 2013, 2014, 2015, nobody knows. But certainly you could see the cracks were getting bigger and bigger and bigger and the ground conditions are relatively, you know, are suspect, they're variable. Um, so she was going to collapse at some stage and if she did, uh, that whole area, as you can see, would be exposed to much, much higher waves than it, is cu it was currently exposed to with the bull's nose in place. So why do anything? Um, this is a remote island off the coast of Cork, but it has been inhabited for many, many centuries. Um, at the moment, there's about 130 full-time residents on the island. There's a national school on the island. There isn't a secondary school. And in summertime, lots of students, kids come across to learn Irish and college there. There's a shop, a few pubs, and lots of tourists come in the summertime to, to hear and learn a bit of Irish, I suppose, and also to look at the wildlife. It's famous for birds, passing birds, and, and dolphins and whales. Um, so there's a huge dependence on the island on this piece of infrastructure. And any threat to this piece of infrastructure was a major threat to the island population. And you can see the size of some of these cracks, because it's enormous. And you can see by the pattern of cracks that 
it was dangerous if one tipped this way and tipped into the harbour. And if it did tip forward, it could even block the whole entrance to the harbour. So major structural cracks, ongoing subsidence of Bull's Nose structure, ongoing deterioration of uh, the structure and, and the piers generally, and the consequences of a collapse were, were, would be catastrophic for the population. So, what was available? Uh, there had been many investigations over the years, but lack of funding, um, some of the proposals, uh, most of them weren't um, <coughs> actioned. But people began to realise that if they didn't take action soon, it would be too late, there'd be a disaster on their hands. So what was there was several boreholes, um, some sampling and testing previously undertaken. <coughs> Kirk McClure Martin did a hydrodynamics um, study of the harbour back in 2001-2002 and they established the most penetrating waves um, occurred when the offshore wave direction was uh, 280 degrees. They proposed a number of solutions but none of them were actioned and there was concerns that uh, the solutions proposed could result in more severe activity than predicted due to the omission of long waves from the study. HMRC then um, came along then and they did a study in 2008 and they studied uh, 12 different harbour options. So if we go back for a minute and developed the long term solution. Um, so they looked at things like breakwaters outside the bull's nose, they looked at um, features to close off the, the, the bull's nose to try and stop the waves coming in, and different type of breakwater structures. But this is the one that was adopted. So to get your bearings again, this is the, the beach here, this is Tuffy's Pier, that's where the bull's nose was or is, and this is where the inner and outer basin are, right? except now it's much bigger, it's a much bigger um, harbour development. So that is a long term plan, and one that I suppose it is still hoped will happen sometime in the future. As you can see, that will cater for um, various uh, marine craft, um, yachts, and what have you, and ferries and fishing boats to a certain extent, although there's not too much fishing in the, on the island. So the information required to um, stabilise the bull's nose and to carry out the work that we were engaged to do, which was to um, um, remodel the bull's nose and provide a storm gate to prevent um, a storm attack on the harbour. So we felt we needed more site investigations, more targeted to the works, we needed more wave data and we needed more wave analysis. So. We didn't have all that expertise, so site investigations was obviously um, contracted out, and that indicated a variation in rock levels. Uh, in actual fact, some peat was uncovered inside in the harbour itself, um, but where the pool's no structure, um, it was predominantly founded in rock, but the rock was falling away sharply, and it, I think it's likely that the original structure wasn't entirely founded on rock, so therefore it subsided and cracked, and of course wasn't reinforced, so and it was also built on top of an old, uh, an ancient structure, so all of those things didn't help. Um, the HMRC data then provided much more information than was available here to four. And Delta Res, who are a Dutch company, they analysed um, the uh, wave uh, information and looked at, tried to explain the phenomenon that was occurring, particularly this phenomenon known as a draw, which uh, the local people uh, described as being a huge pull um, on the vessels at various weather, during various weather conditions. And they concluded the combination of swell waves and long waves appeared to be the reason for the draw on the harbour. And Delta Reds, of course, also provided input for the detailed design. So this is uh, some of the outputs from their uh, modelling. And you can see, I don't know if you can read the numbers, but the, the red on the top, the, the red numbers are 9 to 10 metres high, which you can see as you come into the harbour. You know, the colours are you know, much lighter colours, so indicating much uh, lower wave heights. The dark blues are, you know, 1 to 2, the lighter blue is 2 to 3, and the very light one is 3 to 4. And you can see again from that, uh, that the uh, solution further out, you take this one here, the further out you went, uh, bigger the waves are getting. So this is the uh, adopted the storm gate, where things are much sheltered. And the map above is much sheltered as you move around the corner of the bull's nose. So this seems to be the, the 
best place for um, the stone gate, and that's where it was built. So the proposed development then consisted of a new slipway, the demolition of the bull's nose, a storm gate support structure comprising of a replacement structure for the demolished bull's nose and strengthening works to the outer end of Duffy's Pier, a 12 metres wide hydraulically operated by parting storm gate and reclamation of part of the inner basin. So, let's look at that. So you can see the reconstructed bull's nose above um, and you can see the shape of it in the background. So it's a little bit different shape, but the width into the main harbour area is retained, so the conditions shouldn't change. So the outer break, breakwater pier and the bull's nose are reconstructed. Duffy's pier at the end of that was reshaped, and the structure constructed uh, then went for the storm gate. That resulted in, of course, in a good bit of um, excess material, so some of that was going to be deposited here to reclaim some ground at the back end of the inner basin. I should say that uh, heretofore, uh, the only protection that the islanders have was this area here. For them to close off that area here with stop locks, which meant that during the storm, the boat simply came in here and waited till the storm subsided, then took away the logs again, that will pad finger high on and clean here, and then uh, continue their operations. And every year, um, the harbour would be closed for a number of days, some winters more than others. That's a blow up, and then you can see um, the storm gates here in the middle, wedge by parting, wedge here, <coughs> anchored here, the rams here, had those rams, and we should talk more about those in a few minutes. You can see the existing wood nose and the new one, and some armoring outside, and then the outer basin in here, and then down to the tower here. The design then was um, hydrological studies by HMRC and Delta Res for the references, US um, Army Corps of Engineers Shore Protection Manual, BS6349, obviously maritime structures. And the design considerations, um, the 100 year uh, uh, critical wave height, and variable supports or uh, forces on the gate support hinges and ram during gate opening and closing had to be taken into account. And there's also potential for buoyancy during construction because the um, pier was hollow. And for the gate then, um, a performance specification and exemplar drawings uh, were prepared by KGAL Consulting, who were a specialist uh, UK firm. Seven load cases to be considered. So, needless to say, all of this needed planning permission. And it's in an SAC, so a Natura impact statement was required. A waste management plan was required. Archaeological reports were required, because again, there's some archaeology there. Flood risk assessments. Foreshore lease license, and any of you who have gone through that process know how lengthy it can be. And a search of registration to deposit the excavated and dredged material to reclaim some of the inner basin, which I showed to you a few minutes ago. So, a lot of regulatory requirements, and a lot of consultation, and a lot of time. So, then it moved on to the procurement stage, and uh, for the civil works, we decided on a two-stage process. So uh, candidates were invited to uh, complete a suitability assessment questionnaire with all the associated supplements and uh, appendices, and then shortlisted, and then invited to tender. And for the gate, a single-stage process um, was selected uh, with a, under a design and build um, contract, performance spec and exemplar drawings with an ovation then of the specialist contractor to the main contractor so that when it came to the construction phase there was one contractor and with total responsibility for the delivery of the entire project. So some of the issues that arose then. Uh, on the gate, well obviously there was a need uh, needed to protect the vessels in the basin as I've described earlier on. Uh, the location um, where you put it and Again, we selected the location where the wave height was minimised to minimise the forces on the gate itself and on the hinges and the structure. The type, we looked at single gates, double gates, biparting, up and over gates, under gates, all sorts of things, but the biparting gate um, appeared to give us the more efficient design 
uh, the loads and sizes for single gate options, for example, were very large. And also, the operation of the gate had to be simple. You have to remember that the facilities on the island are minimal. There's a few tractors out there, you know, and, and a certain, you know, obviously some local expertise, but really quite limited. So it had to be simple to operate. Roads infrastructure then, the existing uh, roads around the harbour were very poor. There was a slipway, there was a slipway in the, on that original harbour, but it's tiny and of little use. The main slipway up to, up to this project was a couple of miles away, and the access from that slipway back to the North Harbour, which is the main centre on the island, is extremely narrow, so very poor. So all of that was totally unsuitable for construction traffic. So the contract was set up in such a way that the new slipway would be constructed first and would be used then to uh, bring materials and, of course, equipment and craneage and diggers and whatever it is onto the island to construct the works. And the last point there is the SAC designation, which I referred to earlier on. Another interesting feature was that um, we wondered should we, if you like, have a full closed and sealed gate, you know, all the way down to the bed. And we considered maybe it might be better if there was a little bit of room under it to allow, prevent any stones or something getting trapped. But when we investigated, we found that really if the gap was any more than four to six inches or 100 to 150 millimetres, the wave height that would transmit through the gate could be quite substantial, you know, five, six, seven hundred millimetres. So we needed to keep the gap, any gaps, either to the side or under, to 150 or 100 millimetres or even less. So procurement issues. As with most jobs, there's always some issues. Um, so inevitably there was some challenge by unsuccessful candidates. They didn't like the idea that they weren't shortlisted, so there was, a, there was some debriefing. Um, but that went reasonably uh, well and uh, there was challenges weren't pursued. And in tender evaluation, again, there was other issues and um, some non-compliance issues with some of the tenderers and, and that raised issues as well. But we, we got through all of those and uh, LMK uh, came out of the bunch as the successful contractor. So to conclude my talk, uh, I headed at conclusion and lessons learned and benefits. <laughs> the entire process was more complex than envisaged. It took longer. Um, there was a need for more surveys, more studies. The regulatory requirements took longer than was envisaged. And then during the works there were access and weather conditions, which issues that uh, Richard will speak about shortly. The cost, cost went up as a result. But at the end of the day, the basins are protected. There's a safe haven for vessels. There's a facility to carry out future works in the harbour in dry conditions. Because um, what I didn't actually point out is that stop logs or steel logs can be inserted in front of and behind the gate. So which means that the gate can be uh, maintained in the dry and the harbour can be pumped out and dredged or whatever it is in the dry uh, in future. That's the last point there, facility to provide dry dock for maintenance of the gates in situ. So that concludes uh, my few words. And thank you very much for listening. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. Um, so look, I'll just introduce myself. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know who Ellen M. Keating is. Um, half of this room, I hope, do know who we are, seeing as we all just came off our sites half hour ago. Um, then I'll talk about Cape Clear, so I'll give a, a little background to the, the structural arrangement and talk about some of the key engineering elements, so <coughs> mainly the, the lock chamber, the, the precast lock chamber that we floated out from Cork, and uh, the lock gates. And then myself and John will take um, uh, questions. So I, I'm a graduate of NUIG, uh, graduated in 2007. I'm uh, one of the directors at, at, at Ellen and Keating. 
and last year I was lucky enough to win the um, Engineers Ireland Chartered Engineer of the Year. Ellen Dean Keating, uh, founded by Dublin Man, uh, Louis Keating in 87, still MD and owner um, uh, of, of the company, uh, a very good technical engineer. Um, we, we employ about 110 direct employees, uh, a lot of subcontract. Uh, out of those 110, there's a lot of, a lot of professionals, uh, a lot of engineers, uh, quantity surveyors, technical people. Um, turnover about 60 million. Um, it's, it's come back a lot over the last few years, I'd love to say. And on marine clients, um, we have all the major ports around the country. Um, Department of Marine, Waterways Ireland, um, NRA or TII as they are now, but will work for, for anybody. Our division, so we, we have a very uh, well established building wing. Um, a lot of the guys here are from the building wing in uh, Grange Gorman. We're, we're doing a primary care centre at the moment. Uh, Sancta Maria, we're doing a, a secondary school. Uh, the civil wing, which is my area, and I'll, I'll, I'll focus on that. We have a very strong civil wing and a very strong uh, marine civil wing. Uh, and then plant hire, we, we have a lot of bespoke uh, oddball plant. So there you see a, 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 an amphibious excavator with a lot of crawler cranes, mobile cranes. Uh, hard to get plant. And then we own and operate a number of marinas. So that's the, the biggest one, that's, <coughs> that's Kilrush Marina. Just on the, this marine civils, which is my area and the area I'm, I'm quite passionate about, um, we, we've established a name uh, in marine civils, and particularly in the design and build marine civils uh, since before my time. But this was my, my first contract, uh, uh, Knightstown Harbour floating breakwaters. So here we designed and developed a, a helical anchor mooring system where we could screw in tension anchors from floating plant uh, using 132 anchors to hold in 660 meters of floating concrete breakwater. So those, uh, each of those helical anchors screw down through silt into stronger material below. Uh, very unique uh, solution in a, an environmentally sensitive area. Uh, we, we can do this with very little uh, seabed disturbance and with no diving. And uh, it's the, the, the system down there has resisted many a storm. Uh, this is another uh, bespoke design and build project, uh, Dual and Pier. We were lucky enough to win the Irish Concrete Society Awards uh, recently with this, this project. So uh, a real unique challenge we, we have Dual and Pier, which is very exposed. Uh, takes a lot of wave attack uh, from the Atlantic. We needed a system that was safe without formwork. So here we use 50 ton precast uh, units, place them one after another, and before each storm would come or at the end of each production cycle, we could simply anchor them down to the rock and uh, fill in the stone between them, making them safe before a storm and then conti continue on at the next production cycle after the storm had abated. But some of the real innovative solutions come out of small jobs too. So this is uh, Castle 4 Weir, very small job, uh, conservation job, lime masonry pointing, uh, lime masonry grouting, but we had to make the weir dry. Uh, there was no access down to the site, so we commissioned the construction of this aqua buyer. So this buyer can be rolled out by hand, filled with water, and on this side we're retaining 1.6 metres of water. Uh, on the other side we have perfectly dry working conditions. And here's Grand Canal Dock, our Grand Canal, um, Grand Canal uh, inner city Dublin Canal, we dredged 3.2 kilometres of canal. And we needed a system of keeping the canal dry, which yet letting the flows through the canal, keeping the, the downstream levels topped up. We weren't able to pump because it was expensive because the residents didn't want pumps. So between each, four, each 400 meter stretch of canal, we uh, devised a siphon solution. So using no pumps, we were able to siphon 400 liters of water per second from the upper levels down to the lower levels. A very successful job. Uh, but the, the, the real project I want to talk to you to today about is, is Cape Clear. <coughs> so uh, this, this uh, we'll, we'll just talk about a project scope. Uh, I'll give you a brief, brief rundown on the, the structural arrangement. 
I'll talk about design management, which is key to this job. Uh, touch briefly on logistics, and then we'll, we'll talk about the, the, the two main bits, the, the lock chamber and the, the gate installation. So as John pointed out, Cape Clear, Ireland's uh, most southerly inhabited island. Uh, unique, very challenging place to work. Uh, it's a one hour uh, ferry trip southwest of Baltimore Harbor. Uh, two to three hours for a cargo boat. Uh, lovely, lovely place, but terrible, terrible to get any work done. Um, so this is the, the, the harbour entrance, as John says, gets a big wave attack from the Atlantic, floods the harbour, empties the harbour, causes a lot of damage, and makes it a very, very hard place to work. But the harbour itself, it's absolutely essential to the islanders. It's their only link between here and the mainland. Um, uh, so a totally essential bit of, of, of infrastructure. This is the, the, the job here, and we were uh, lucky to be successful in the construction of the 70 meter slipway. The reconfiguration of the two uh, pier heads, uh, the construction of an X block uh, rock armored revetment, and perhaps the most interesting bit the lock chambers and uh, the lock chamber and uh, the storm gate. We had some key de design parameters, as John pointed out. We had to design a gate which had a 12 meter uh, clear opening. But one of the toughest parts about that is uh, the gate had to withstand a four meter wave while the mitre gate was opening or closing. So before it could get into its mitred strong position, the rams had to withstand a four meter wave attack. And then when the gates were in their closed position, they had to me mesh very accurately and a pin be dropped down to, to lock the gates and stop them from banging during a storm. It sounds like a really, a really uh, simple thing to do now, but there was many a night lost on it. The entire system then had to be CE marked to an execution class two. It had to be low maintenance and intuitive. So there's a large panel of islanders that operate that gate by push button. That so had to be very intuitive. All of this working on an island uh, an hour off the mainland in a special area of conservation. And I said the, the harbour is a vital link. So the harbour had, had to be maintained at all times. Access to the harbour had to be maintained at all times. So you can divide this job up into four main elements. You have the, the gate, which keeps out the waves, the hydraulics, which actuate the gate, um, the chamber, that houses the gates and formed a large part of our temporary works. And then the civils package, which remodeled the, uh, the piers and, and uh, the slipways. Just to give you a, a rundown on how the whole thing works to, to find your bearings. So yeah, we have the, the, the bull's nose at the top here, which is uh, in disrepair, and Duffy's Pier, which is a 1960s sheep pile pier, in situ concrete deck. We had to put this lock chamber um, uh, in to, to, to house the gates. So the, the, the base of the lock chamber is seven meters below high water. Um, the, the rock, the, the ground bearing stratum, 10 meters below high water. So we needed a, a, a foundation and a system of doing foundations underwater. So we developed this way of uh, th this uh, structural screed. So we had a, a large, um, uh, structural st steel frame which we could level above water and create three bearing strips. Each of those strips is uh, within three millimeters of each other. So that means when we bring in our big uh, precast chamber, it sits on them evenly and doesn't rock. This is the, the, the chamber which we're going to talk about later on. Then to, to come up out of the water with the, the bull's nose pier construction, we use a, a caisson pier construction technique. So each of these Lego blocks was precast on the mainland, uh, maybe five to eight tons each, and built, uh, built in stretcher bond, like block work. Each uh, block was then infilled and stitched to the course above it. On the Duffy's pier side, we used a sheet pile uh, pier construction, matching the, uh, the existing Duffy's pier with a, a concrete deck. 
on Duffy's Pier, once out of the out of low water, uh, we precast retaining wall units. So contractor designed precast retaining wall units that were fo that formed the curve. And um, again, not exposing any any formwork to the elements, we could then stitch them all together by uh, forming an in situ wall on the back of the uh, the precast walls. And then each of the piers received a, a, an in situ concrete deck um, and in situ plant rooms. Those plant rooms then control the, each of the 30 ton gate leaves. And the, the, the rams activate, actuate it then. So if we go back and talk about uh, design management, uh, so the four main elements to the design. But we, we undertook or we, we, we wanted to, to uh, maintain a lot of design control on this because uh, the design, uh, each of the design elements heavily influenced the other design elements and the construct constructability of it. Um, so we appointed uh, over 14 different designers to this and uh, we ensured that each of the designs uh, talked to each other. So just to to um, show you how uh, intricate that design was, if we look at the, uh, the hydraulic design or the, the rams, so uh, we developed a, an algorithm in-house, essentially a, a big, big Excel, Excel sheet that looked at all the implications of moving the, uh, the ram pivot points further and closer away from the, uh, the gate hinge. And uh, we came up with the optimal solution to enable us to go and order the rams. But the rams were on a 26-week 26, 26 lead-in. Each of them cost over 100 grand. And we had to decide very, very early on in the contract that those rams would have 140 ton capacity, that they would have a stroke of 4.653 meters, um, and that they could be ordered and, and uh, would be right for the job. There was only a five mil tolerance on the rams once they were in place. The positioning of those rams governs uh, the, the, the vertical positioning and the horizontal positioning of those rams on the gate governs the, um, the structure of the gate. It governs the geometry of the gate. So we had to take these gates down the M9 motorway. There was only 7.2 meters between toll booths. So all of these constraints had to be considered very, very early on. And where that ram uh, sits on the gate, of course, will govern the forces that go back into the lock chamber walls. So that's important, uh, obviously, for the, uh, for, for the design of the walls, but also for the, the weight of this overall precast lock chamber. One for the uh, anti-buoyancy rock anchors that were installed, so 12 100 ton rock anchors. And, and two for our temporary work, so floating this into the harbour. We were already um, stuck for, um, for bed clearance coming into the harbour, so we, we wanted this structure as light as possible. We took on and we elected to take on a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of design responsibility for this and uh, offer a lot of, of, um, of alternatives, design contractor designed alternatives. We had the design and build package for the gates, but we were in a traditional design for the civils. And we felt we could add, add value to this, because we have a lot of uh, design experience. So uh, if you take the, the top, top five on the contract, Paul, Paul Cannon's there, uh, we reckon we had 84 years of, of marine construction experience uh, that we could offer to the job. By taking on each of the designers directly, we could allow each of the designers focus on what they're good at. So it's very hard to find someone who uh, is experienced in hydraulic design or is experienced in electrical design, but also knows how the sea works and how uh, this gate needs to work for the islanders. So we could take them on direct and let them focus on what they're good at and be sure that we communicate that design across the, the, the disciplines. It also allowed us to ensure that there was uh, design sympathy with the construction, construction methods. Uh, we had some very bespoke methods with some very bespoke challenges, um, and the design had to, uh, had to accommodate that. And there's also a commercial advantage. 
So we were able to lead the design in uh, uh, toward methods that suited our expertise and suited the, the, the plant and equipment and labour that we had. So we touch on, on logistics. Um, when we arrived, there was nothing. We landed at high water on a beach uh, with a, a, a 30 ton excavator and excavated our way up onto the island. Once onto the island, we created a slipway, which now allow, allowed us to land a lot more gear and a lot more equipment and set up a mobile, or set up a, a concrete batching plant. So we batched over 600 cube of concrete on the island. Um, um, everybody who worked out there, worked out there, stayed out there for, for uh, sometimes a number of weeks without getting home, sometimes uh, with a lot of cancelled ferries and a lot of grief at home, I'm sure. So the way we, we approached this, we tried to prefabricate as much as we could. So we, uh, instead of an in-situ concrete wall on Duffy's Pier, we had a sheet pile wall with an in-situ deck. Instead of an in-situ uh, curved um, uh, Duffy, uh, Bosnose Pier, we had uh, precast uh, pier elements and precast caissons. And then of course the, the, the big element of it we had a 1,000 ton concrete lock chamber, so we, we precast that as well. So if we look at the chamber, chamber has to be a very, very strong structure. So the, the base of the chamber, um, it's got 700 mil thick walls, very, very heavily reinforced. In fact, um, O'Connor Sutton Cronin won uh, the ACEI award recently for their work on, on the, the chamber structure. Uh, so it has to be very, very strong to resist the, the gate forces uh, to resist the, the, the deck loadings. Uh, a difficult one to construct because we've got rock here that meets the structure over here and then very, very weak material here that had to be, um, uh, had to be dredged and replaced. To make it more difficult, it's all underwater, of course, and traditional methods of construction underwater by diver were out of the question because it's, it's terribly exposed. It would have been totally unsafe. Even if it was safe, the... The, um, uh, the tolerances required for this uh, structure to work were just out of the question for traditional forms and traditional divers. So we had a, a, a concept design. So we prefabricated this 15 by 15 meter squared um, uh, chamber, nine meters high. Now I give this or a similar presentation to, to school kids. So, uh, <laughs> I think we all understand meters here, but had we wanted to, for some uh, strange reason, we could have transported four articulated wagons in the base of it, it's that big. Uh, we met it in Verome Dockyard, which is normally used for the repair and building of ships. Uh, so on a, on a gravel bed, we were able to construct this with uh, traditional, uh, traditional uh, former techniques. Uh, so this U-shaped structure then got a set of uh, steel stop blocks, uh, uh, watertight steel stop blocks. Uh, there's a false base in it to catch the water. And then on top, we have a steel deck, all totally watertight, all inspected by naval architects, inspected by the Department of Marine uh, before transport. Once it was finished, we um, then transported from Cove, 130 kilometers, out to uh, Cape Clear Harbour on the, the 27th of uh, September 2014. The chamber in Verome was flooded and thankfully this chamber rose with it and it was tugged out to Cape Clear to arrive at the right stage of the right tide with the right t weather conditions. We had a two hour window in which to get this chamber past that point there to clear the seabed with about 300 mils millimeters to spare. It was then pushed into accepting jaws uh, to land in exactly the right spot. In the meantime, in Thompson's of Carlo, we were fabricating two 30-ton gate leaves. These were transported by road uh, down rolling with rolling road closures of the M9 motorway overnight, transported to the island by barge, lifted into place with a 220-ton crane to slot exactly into place. Today, the gates are 
actuated by this uh, uh, very t technically comprehensive hydraulic power unit, one on each uh, one on each pier, with a central HMI or a central uh, screen. But all the islanders do is press a button, and over two minutes, these gates close to within five millimeters of their position. A 20-ton latching pin then drives down between the gates, locking them before a storm would come. And when the storm abates, the island just, just press a button again, and these gates op uh, come back into their open position. So that's, that's the, the, the Cape Clear project. Um, thank you very much.